Walt Disney, the man of a thousand stories. I'm sure you've heard your share of things about this cartoon mogul, from him being a closeted Nazi to a currently frozen head in a tank of liquid nitrogen right now. For just one person, he certainly made a mark on the world. Let's talk about Disney. I'm Tristan Johnson and this is Step Back History. Be sure to click the subscribe button as well as smash the bell notification to never miss a new Step Back video or live stream. Remember a few videos back when I said this? Man, that would not fly in the modern MCU, but it would better symbolize Disney's founder, a video for a different time. Well, I wanted to follow up on my throne shade, and for good or ill, Walt Disney is a key figure in cultural history. He was actually born in Chicago in 1901, but his family moved around a lot throughout his youth, as his father made stabs at farming, delivering newspapers, and working in a jelly and fruit juice factory. Walt himself was more of an artist than a student, and so dropped out of high school at age 16. With a forged birth certificate, he managed to join the Red Cross Ambulance Corps to aid the U.S. Army in the First World War. Hey, that rhymes. Disney magic. He arrived in France to help out in late 1918, shortly after the signing of the armistice that ended the First World War. He helped out with some random tasks before eventually getting a discharge the next year. He moved to Kansas City after that, hoping to become a newspaper cartoonist. He quickly became an illustrator for magazine ads, as they didn't use photos all that much in magazines back then, and did some drawings for movie theaters. He reportedly enjoyed it, but was more interested in animation. Enter into his life making cartoons. The most famous mouse in history was born early in the Disney timeline. After a few successful cartoons based on Alice in Wonderland, he developed an original character he called Mortimer Mouse. He eventually decided Mickey would be a better name. His debut was in the 1928 short film Steamboat Willie, and was one of the first cartoons ever to have synchronized sound effects. He was the late 20s version of a viral sensation. There were Mickey Mouse clubs for children, and in the truly American fashion, the success quickly followed up with merchandising and comic strips. The first voiceover for Mickey premiered in 1929's The Carnival Kid. Mickey's first words were, hot dog. Eventually, Disney decided to voice Mickey himself, which he did until 1947. His animation company became a massive empire. He got into feature films with Snow White, and during his life collecting something like 22 Oscars and another 59 nominations. But old Walt wanted more. Disney wanted to start a little theme park near his studio in Burbank, but these plans quickly became more and more ambitious. It got to the point where in 1953, he had to hire a team of researchers to find the perfect place to build a theme park, factoring population growth, weather patterns, and transportation routes. They eventually found the home of Disneyland, a 160-acre grove of orange trees in Anaheim, California. They broke ground in 1954, and on July 17th a year later, Disneyland opened and it was a disaster. There was a surge of counterfeit tickets, leading to too many guests. Rides broke, the park was unfinished, oh, and there was a gas leak that forced part of the park to close? The TV broadcast celebrating the park's opening even had technical difficulties. Early jitters aside, Walt Disney loved his park. He even kept an apartment there. One of his projects was a utopian city concept. There was a terrifying angle to that considered utopia, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, we should discuss how Disney was not some magical creature divorced from his dark side, nor from historical context. As many of you have likely heard, the Disney company was involved in creating propaganda for the United States during the Second World War. It began with some short educational films, such as a 1942 film, The New Spirit, which taught people how to file their taxes to support the war effort. Many of the propaganda films starred Donald Duck, and were in thousands of movie theaters. One even got an Academy Award nomination, as if he needed more. The education videos turned into military training videos, and Disney also designed a lot of military insignias. He had built a reputation for himself in such politically divisive times as a non-political maker of cartoons. However, he began to come around, producing blatant works of propaganda for the U.S. Army, like the probably famous film Der Führer's Face, a film making fun of Nazis starring Donald Duck. He started to take this seriously, producing some pretty terrifying films such as Education for Death, 
the making of a Nazi. He also became obsessed with a book called Victory Through Air Power, and adapted it to drum up support of use of long-range strategic bombing. It apparently worked, getting the attention of both President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. I can't show these in this video due to copyright, something else we can blame Disney for. If you can, go find these wartime Disney films. They're quite a surreal watch, and with no more than a little blatant racism when depicting the Japanese. Either way, they're quite a fascinating blip in American cultural history. Here's where we start to see an infamous side of Disney, however. He criticized a lot of the parts of Nazi ideology through these propaganda films, but one thing he never criticized was the Nazi regime's anti-Semitism. Disney was a very socially conservative man. He was a staunch capitalist, and despite criticizing a lot of Nazi ideology in films like Education for Death, embodied many of the very things he rallied against. Rumors are still commonplace that Disney was a Nazi, and while it would be unfair without evidence to call him a Nazi with a capital N, he definitely had aspects of their ideology in his politics. The better term would probably be Nazi sympathizer. Before the war, there were meetings of people openly supporting and interested in the Nazi form of government. These groups were small, but reportedly fiercely loyal and were open to the public. On a few occasions, Disney and his lawyer Gunther Lessig were spotted in attendance along with a lot of other Nazi-aligned Hollywood elites. This organization was the German-American Bund, which would eventually become the American Nazi Party of today. More on them in my neo-Nazi video, or my video on hate groups. I'm getting so sick of Nazis. Why did they have to become relevant again? He also hosted a visit from the Nazi filmmaker Leni Riefenstahl when she came to America to promote her film Olympia in 1938. You might remember her if you ever took a film class as the director behind the infamous Triumph of the Will Nazi propaganda film. This was only about a month after the notorious Kristallnacht, a night of brutal assaults on German Jewish businesses and homes. You could write this off as the West's all too comfortable relationship with the Nazi regime that we try hard to forget happened, but his peers even criticized Disney for this act. Even after the war, this whiff of anti-Semitism spilt over into his 50s politics. Amongst the hardcore anti-communists of the Red Scare, there was a common association between Jews and communists, which might have fueled their enthusiasm for destroying the lives of anyone a little too far left of center. But I don't want to spoil too much of next week's video. Oops. Disney was a full and happy player in McCarthy's purges. He was a member of many of the 50s witch-hunting organizations like the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, which was associated with the infamous House on American Activities Committee, the former being notorious for it being quietly a very anti-Semitic organization. Some folks, like Disney's own grandniece Meryl Streep, have confirmed the alliance was an anti-Semitic industry lobbying group. Not too surprisingly then, Disney also had a opinions about organized labor. The utopic city Epcot, he imagined. It was a place where unions would be illegal, democracy non-existent, and of course, no social safety net. All enforced by his own written laws and a proto-police security force. It was like a prototype of the gated community. And this ethos followed into the corporation he created. In the 1960s, the Disney Corporation lobbied to create the Reedy Creek Improvement District and the government gave broad authority over it to the Disney Corporation. They to this day have pretty much complete control over the land and do whatever they want with it. It's political insulation to protect them from labor regulations and competition, a true model for the corporatist worldview. Walt Disney was a longtime smoker and in 1966 he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Only a month later on December 15th, he died. Not long after he died, there was a rumor that he had been cryogenically frozen. This is actually a myth. He was cremated and his ashes are in a mausoleum in California. The rumor probably persists because the first person to be cryogenically frozen was put on ice in January of 1967, just a month after Disney's death. A history of cryogenic freezing that might be a fun video. 
If only I had a Know Your Sci-Fi series. Today, Disney is a massive corporation and frequently lobbies governments to change policy to their will. The US is extremely long-term for copyright being an example, or the fact that Disney just flat out bought up a ton of Fox's properties in the not too distant past without the word antitrust flying anywhere. In many ways, the corporation Disney made with his values is responsible for a lot of the corporate dominance in the United States today. It's also responsible for a lot, and I mean like a metric ton of our cultural masonry. It's as ingrained a part of America as apple pie, burgers, and for-profit medicine. Welcome to the end. Sometimes YouTube makes it a little, hmm, difficult to find when your favorite YouTubers have a new video out. To help you out with that, I have a mailing list you can sign up for. I'll let you know via email when a new video goes live. This video was made possible by these wonderful patrons, as well as the rest of my patrons over at Patreon. I'd especially like to thank Don and Carrie Johnson, as well as Colbine Mani for their generosity. The theme song is by 12 Tone, and come back next time for more Step Back. <laughs> Whew.